Good evening, everyone. This is the regular monthly meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, February 10th at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. As a reminder, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment tonight to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table uh, next to Megan Hewitt. All right, we're going to start off today with our flag salute with Leicester School. Please welcome Principal Novak. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to turn it over to my student council right now, and they will lead us in the pledge. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we have two of our student council members here with us this evening. The other two are at a basketball game. And we have our, um, one of our student council facilitators with us, Mrs. Kathy Yee. And Mrs. Marina Kasicki is ill with the flu. Tis the season. So um, I am going to turn it over to our student council right now. And they're going to share a little bit about what happens with student council at Leicester. I'm Matthew Novak, the Vice President. I'm Nora Benjamin, the Treasurer, which is also a basketball game. <laughs> <laughs> um, so last spring, we partnered with St. Baldrick's Shave for the Brave to raise money for childhood cancer. We also partnered with the PTA for the Playground Committee and hosted a Happy Grams fundraiser. We raised, raised almost $1,000. In September, our student council sponsored a hat day to raise money for residents of the Bahamas who were devastated by the recent hurricane. Over $700 were donated to AmeriCares Foundation Incorporated for a direct hurricane relief. Um, so this year we also did Red Ribbon Week. Our theme this year was follow your dreams and live drug free. We had spirit days like PJ Day, Sports Day, and Red Day. Um, students also received a special pencil, bookmark, and we signed a pledge to live drug free. In November, the student council um, raised some dough by selling <laughs> tickets for kids to throw a pie of whipped cream at our PE teacher, Mr. Donnelly. We raised over $1,200 that went to holiday gift cards for local families in need. Um, so th these are some of the students that got to throw pie. Um, kindergarten did it. All the grades, two representatives from every grade got to throw. So, some of them. <laughs> in December, we brought warmth and cheer to the local families by collecting new hats, mittens, scarves, and toys. These items decorated the tree in our front hall and were donated to Downers Grove Sharing Connection and People's Resource Center. Um, so what we're going to do next, um, in the spring, we're going to host a spring cleaning donation drive and collect supplies for Sharing Connections in Downers Grove. So along with that, we're going to do an April Fool Foolishness Spirit Week, um, and we'll also continue to collect pop tabs to support Ronald and McDonald House Charity. Um, we also hope to create an addition to our flower garden in honor of Sophia, Sophia Berry, a former Leicester student who passed away a few years ago. So we just want to thank everybody from the Leicester community for all their support for our activities. And we are excited for what is to come. So, just a few things about Lester. Um, we, we wanted to take a look at the district goals, and one of them is the focus on learning. 
So uh, up here on the screen is Lester's IAR performance um, and along with Park. And that was something that once the district shifted the philosophy in terms of focusing on this tests and the scores, we have had a steady progression in the upward direction um, over the last several years in all the um, areas of reading math as well as our participation rate. Also, in reading and math, our District 58 strategic plan um, has a goal that by the spring of 2021, our medium percentile achievement in reading um, through MAP would be measured at the 80th or greater uh, percentile, and in math, it would be at the 77th or greater percentile. As of the spring last year, uh, Lester is measuring at the 77th percentile in reading and at the 73rd percentile in math. So that puts us well on our way to achieve that goal in the next couple years. Now, our focus on learning. We have those professional learning Mondays. We love them. We are able to do a lot of things on those uh, days. We have our school improvement days, our institute days, which are definitely shorter in length, um, along with the faculty meetings that, um, while we have some time in our faculty meetings, with the push of the school day to a little bit later, um, that doesn't give us a whole lot of time for those meaningful discussions, so those professional learning Mondays are really key for us. And some of the things that we have done at Leicester is, last year we um, began learning about growth mindset and shifting our thinking from, you know, fixed to growth. And, you know, part of those things in the growth mindset is to look at, um, you know, we see mistakes as opportunities to learn, you know, rather than something that's bad. We um, learn about the power of yet. I, you know, don't know how to do this yet. You know, so putting that positive spin and then grit and perseverance and um, moving forward to become problem solvers and not giving up. So just shifting that thinking a little bit. And so last year we learned all about that and this year we're putting that into our practice, you know, with our kids. This year, our, one of our focuses is on diversity training. And um, we have had the opportunity to uh, do some professional development with the staff in the area of bias and looking at race and gender and we've done those already and then we have um, the English language learners coming up some special needs and poverty that will be some of the, the topics that um, I will also be covering you know into the spring this year also across the district we are focused on discipline with dignity and that is the uh, father and son team of Alan and Brian Mendler and um, their practice and Mrs. Novosel, she has taken on uh, this task you know, with everybody and uh, looking at some, we are just kind of reviewing some of our practice you know, that um, we have in how to motivate kids and what is um, stress and how to, um, how to disagree without being disagreeable and those kinds of things that are all part of um, the learning that is you know, found within this resource. Another one of the district goals is securing our future. And we're very big on safety at Leicester. And so about the last year and a half, we had been collaborating with the Downers Grove Police and the Village and the Public Works Department. And um, the end result was that we were able to create a new path, uh, traffic pattern and flow around Leicester. So we were able to change a two-way a street to a one-way. Um, there were a, there was a no U-turn section that was causing you know quite a bit of congestion. Um, this included all updated traffic signs around you know Leicester and a revised student lineup system, so that the flow and everything is now much smoother than it was previously in the past. And then there's connecting to our community. So you heard from our student council, we have a, just an outstanding PTA and they'll be speaking in just a few moments. We have partnerships with a number of different community organizations and I just listed a few and I'm sure there's a few more that 
I have forgotten and I'm sorry about that, but um, there's a lot. We have our Lester volunteers. We love to have you know our community into our classrooms as guest readers or whatever. Um, this year we have our Seesaw Initiative that we are communicating you know, and having student portfolios for our parents. So those are all fabulous things. One of our um, organizations that you know, we have at Lester is called OAV and it's Our American Voice. And our American Voice um, is an organ is a little club that basically is part of the Barrett Foundation, and the Barrett Foundation promotes um, civics and education and social justice, and has people, uh, you know, the kids kind of take a look at what kinds of issues and things and needs are happening within their community, and to kind of take an action approach with that and to come up with some kind of um, a need and then solve that problem using community resources. So some of the things that they have done over the years is they have uh, worked to provide some assistance for the visually impaired over at Herrick. We had a mix it up at lunch day that was featured on WGN. Uh, last year we partnered with the group Mavens, the Mothers <coughs> Against Violence in Schools, and uh, did inspirational messages throughout our building. And this year, the focus is on uh, creating a sensory path at Leicester. So that will be our end result, um, hopefully, you know, by the end of this school year. Pending some floor cleaning and then putting some things down, <laughs> and waxing and, and stuff. So um, just in the proper order. And then we cannot forget to mention the big news at Leicester, which is our playground committee. Um, that was something that has truly been in the making since probably, you know, 2014, 15. Um, Heather Neal, one of our parents who has now, you know, as all, you know, wonderful families do, their children grow and move on to Herrick and move on to North. And so, you know, others then come in and take over. Um, Heather Neal be began this um, with Becky Rankin and then um, Patty Esslinger took hold of it in 2017 and boy did she go and uh, you know she turned she created a Lester playground committee she turned it into a 501c3 she you know began doing all kinds of fundraising and donations and company and you know community matches and all kinds of things and um, what ended up happening was we were able to fund um, not one, but two playgrounds at Leicester. We have two, you know, uh, an east and a west side. And um, the ladies and gentlemen that are in the picture right there, that is our Leicester Community Playground. And um, one of our families, you know, in the center in that picture, um, the Gowell family was also featured on NBC, um, you know, because we want to make this playground similar to Hillcrest in that it is accessible to children of all ages, shapes, sizes, and needs. Oh, wait, I'm backwards, sorry about that. Okay, and also the big news mm -hmm. is that we are opening Lester's time capsule, and that is 25 years, it's been in the wall at Lester. Um, that, little pic, that little shot that's right there behind the 25 is what it looks like in the wall. And <laughs> so that's what we will be taking out. And um, actually one of our teachers, uh, Mrs. Winecki, she was a student uh, at Leicester when the time capsule was put into place. And so she is very excited to see what is coming out because she cannot remember back 25 years as to what you know was in there. But um, so right now our BLT and our staff and everybody is in the um, middle of planning so more to come on that and you'll all be invited so <laughs> oh my goodness I keep hitting the back there we go so um, thank you so much for you know your support as we continue to work towards all our goals and I am now going to turn it over to Stephanie Brockway and um, she is our um, vice president for PTA mm -hmm. so. Thank you so much for uh, welcoming us in today to tell you a little bit about our life at Leicester. I feel like a slacker because I have no presentation. Uh, but uh, to be fair, our, our president actually fell ill today, so I'm standing in last minute. So if I bumble like an idiot, at least I have an excuse. <laughs> Next year, if you invite us back, that, that can't fly. So this is, this is where we're at. Um, but I'm very, very happy to be here on behalf of the PTA. Um, 
we are blessed with an amazing community <coughs> around Leicester. And uh, I've been a Leicester parent, um, I think, for eight years now. Um, and I'll be here for another, I think, five or six. So um, I'm, I'm really running the gamut here, so getting to know the community really well with them. Um, I've just been amazed over the course of time that the willingness of our parents and their families and the rest of our community to come together. Um, as a PTA, uh, we have a focus of supporting our kids in the school and making sure that we support their learning, their growth, and their happiness. And to do that, we also need to support our teachers and the staff and make sure that they have what they need and the, the additional little things that can just add that little extra touch in the classroom. So that's a focus for us. And then building the community. So we have efforts in all three of those areas. Um, as a PTA, we're very active in fundraising. Um, I know like the, the fundraising that we did for the Leicester Community Playground was an enormous amount. And one would worry, um, and we all did when that effort started, whether or not we could sustain fundraising for a huge playground effort and also support all the things that we want to continue to do for our school. But our parents and our community have really come through, and we are still able to um, work to provide extra books for the library, provide each of our teachers a little bonus gift. Um, we've started doing that in the fall and the spring so they can buy and refresh things for their classrooms. Um, we help Lester by fulfilling wish list items, um, which could include a laminator whenever one goes out. Uh, <laughs> and not my $20 desktop one. Um, you know, so we, we've had, um, you know, the support to do all of that um, and support the clubs that our kids love so much after school, um, you know, throughout the year. Um, you know, and on the back end of that, we do lots of social things too because part of um, getting parents involved and keeping their kids interested in the school is is to get them to socialize and feel that connection so we do things like daddy daughter dance which just happened this last Friday we have a mother son bowling event coming up um, we do a fun run every year in the fall which is a huge success um, just every year we've had I think we had like 500 a uh, little over 500 participants in our fun run this last year um, which was an amazing effort and, and countless volunteers to make all that happen. So we do little things to help build that community and bring everybody together because, you know, we all want the best for our kids and we want to support Lester. Um, and on behalf of the PTA, I also want to say thank you to the board for the support that you've given us over the years. I know we know that you have listened and you've heard and um, it may not always be the answer we want, but um, we like it when it is. <laughs> and, and, and it's all good. It, the board has been good to us, and uh, Downers Grove has been good to us. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right, uh, to our student council members that are here, um, Member Harris has some gifts for you, and we'd also like to take a quick picture with you as well.
Next up, the board would like to recognize the 444 students who participated in the 39th Annual Science Fair at O'Neill Middle School this year. Each student created a written report and a display and gave an oral presentation for the judges. We are also grateful to the staff, community members, and parents who volunteered to make this learning opportunity possible for all of our students. With that, we're gonna move on to a spotlight on our schools with an update on professional learning with Justin Sissel and Jane Uzentis. Thank you. <clears throat> Over the course of last school year, we talked quite a bit about professional learning and what it looked like in District 58 and some of the needs we had identified. And one of our commitments throughout the course of last year was to bring back to the board regular updates on what that professional learning uh, looked like and what some of the outcomes were. And so that begins this evening. We're going to talk a little bit about the impact of professional learning time, all the different types of professional learning time on teachers and students and learning. Uh, we're going to take a look at feedback from parents and teachers. We have literally thousands of pieces of individual feedback from, from our teaching staff and from our parent community. And so while there are cer it certainly runs the gamut in terms of individual responses, what we've tried to do for tonight is to pick out some themes, both in terms of areas that we are being commended and in terms of some areas for ongoing reflection and growth as we continue to um, work through all of these professional learning opportunities. One of the, the connections from that feedback and part of our conversation last year was the usage of subs and what that looks like if, both for professional learning and for other purposes in the district. So we'll spend a bit of time talking about that. And then as I mentioned, looking at areas of revision and refinement as part of that ongoing reflection and improvement process <coughs> as we look toward next school year. So when we think specifically of the professional learning Mondays, again, there are three uh, sort of silos in which these fall. There are a number, about a third of the Mondays are district directed, which essentially means the district administration is planning the activities. Today was an example of one of those Mondays. And some of the topics that have been mentioned, um, you might recall that uh, Karen Novak just spent some time talking about discipline with dignity. And so this year the rollout for that began on a district directed Monday when we were able to have the entire staff together or at least half of the staff on one side of town and half on the other to begin with sort of a consistent unified presentation and then it rolled into a building directed Monday so those are the kinds of Mondays that are planned by building administration and again that's that that's ongoing <coughs> conversations around things like discipline with dignity and some outside presenters and also some a lot of student data conversations and really getting into some of those more um, rich and meaningful conversations around instruction at the building level there are also about a third of the Mondays that are teacher directed which simply means the teachers have the ability to plan and direct their their professional learning for those days with an emphasis on collaboration and, and learning together as a group although there are certainly some opportunities where people have taken advantage of webinars or even people in some of our more specialized uh, teaching assignments are have visited other districts and other buildings to see what their counterparts may look like so we've had some really exciting opportunities come up with with those kinds of Mondays for teachers as well we do continue to have the Institute Days. These are the full days of professional learning. These are the days that are, are given to us by the county. We have four per year. We spend two of them at the beginning of the year before student attendance begins. And so this year, that was, if you remember, we've been talking about, about math a lot, but this year, in August, we were beginning a new science implementation. So that gave us an extended period of time to bring in some outside presenters for, to refresh our science professional learning. We had some outside presenters from Apple, and there was also some building-based time. One of those days in August is typically a full building day to sort of get ourselves situated for the beginning of the school year. In December, we uh, operate in sort of a, a mini conference format where there are certain uh, sessions that we ask all teachers to attend and there are other sessions in which teachers have a field of choice. We had, I believe, 170 unique offerings this year as part of that conference format. Um, we had outside presenters come into the district. We also have a number of sessions that are presented by District 58 staff. And so this is a new learning opportunity for staff and it's also one that is much appreciated and we, we really do tend to get a lot of positive feedback on that day and that format. And then coming up in February, we have our fourth Institute Day, our fourth full day of professional learning. And February 28th, or a date right around there, that last Friday typically, is a county-wide day. So what that means is we have a couple of different options. For us this year, those of us who will be responsible for direct instruction in mathematics will begin our professional learning around our new math resources. So that those people will be staying in district and we'll be bringing trainers in for that day. Those people who are not involved in that will have a number of opportunities to attend professional learning sessions across DuPage County. And this is another place where some of that really targeted professional learning can occur for our related service staff. Sasset has some great offerings for our, our art and music staff. And even for our, our middle school um, specialists, there are a lot of opportunities to receive some of those targeted professional learning 
uh, opportunities. When we think about the impact, there are really kind of three major areas that I want to just I want to reference tonight. Um, the first, and then one of the ones we talked about a lot last year, is the fidelity of curriculum implementation. The, the feedback we hear from teachers is the time that we have had to really become comfortable <coughs> and, and learn fully this new science curriculum before we are standing up in front of students, the time to really have an understanding of what this is asking of us and what it's going to look like and how we can work together as grade level teams has been really valuable. Another area is just the time to, to have discussions around students and grouping and data and decision making in those instructional pieces, which really helps to see to, to feel the confidence and fidelity of those decisions we're making, whether they're happening at the beginning of the year or mid-year, whether it's about moving students in and out of interventions, or whether it's simply about planning the kinds of, of groupings that are going to happen in a classroom for instruction that coming week. It really, that time allows our teachers to dig deeper into data, into conversations, into stronger decision making. And that really leads into that last piece, which is teachers are, are, are telling us in the feedback we're getting, they're feeling good about coming back into the classroom on Tuesday when they've had that time to really dig into these things. And, and research will tell us that when a teacher feels confident in what they're doing, that actually perhaps has the strongest impact on increasing student achievement, that teacher confidence and self-efficacy. Another word that comes up a lot is consistency, and that is one of the benefits that we've seen already throughout the first, you know, just, just over half of this year. That weekly consistency allows for learning, implementation, reflection, and more learning in a continuous cycle. So we're not waiting weeks and weeks or months until we have a chance to reflect as grade level groups or with our, our teaching partners on these things that we're learning and trying out. We have a chance to come back together regularly that we can count on. Consistency also appears because this time allows us to have more opportunity to present consistent messaging and have consistent presentation of information. We've had more opportunity to bring grade level teams together, to bring entire district uh, teams of teachers together, and that really helps to ensure that we are, we are providing and everyone is getting a sense of these are things we're all doing together and they're, they're, we gain some consistency there. The other consistency is the actual, is the fact that it is predictable. Now having had about 17, 18 of these Mondays, we're, we're getting much better at knowing what we can and can't fit into that time, what is going to work, what is the right amount of, of learning that can be accomplished, what kind of targets and, and we can set and outcomes we can expect from each Monday and then from a series of Mondays. So the very, consist the very predictability allows for us to get better and better at using that specific amount of time each week. <coughs> I'm going to ask um, some members of our professional learning council, you'll recall that's the group of teachers and administrators who have been a, uh, a sounding board and a feedback group and really part of the creation of all of this. Uh, a few of those teachers are going to share in the presentation tonight. So at this point, um, Shore Costello from Highland and Bob Luciano from Fairmount are going to take over. Hi, I'm Shore Costello from Highland School. And we just wanted to share with you some of the feedback that we have um, received from staff. So the first question right here is how valuable was today's professional learning experience for you personally? And um, after every professional learning Monday, the staff is asked to fill out an exit slip to reflect on each session. And so you can see we have about 4,600 responses. And so around 82% is showing you that we find it very uh, valuable or extremely valuable. And the results of that is extremely overwhelming compared to what you see, the threes, the twos, and the ones. The next slide is how productive um, today's pro professional learning is and is the time used efficiently. And then the same thing, if you combine the fours and the fives of productive and extremely productive, it's around 84%. Um, find the time to be very productive and we'll explain in later slides of how we use that time um, and give you specific examples. Um, what's important is that the time that is dedicated to these tasks at hand, um, we're really committed to maximizing that time. And as Justin said, we're able to target and figure out what can we do in that time? What would we um, use for the next Monday that we could fix something that we hadn't done? Or if there's something at a district level, how can we bring it to the building and therefore how can we bring it personally? Like for example, in my fourth grade classroom. Um, the next one, oh I'm clicking, sorry. The next one is um, how do you feel uh, today's professional learning will have it, when I'm sorry when do you feel today's professional learning will have an impact on your students and you can see that it's extremely valuable because whether the impact is immediate or um, thereafter it's it's a, a huge <coughs> impact so you could just see even in the pie chart where the majority is immediate the rest is within 
mostly within the school year. And this last slide that I'm going to present to you um, is asking if, um, I'm sorry, if the goals on Monday were to provide building teams of teachers the opportunity to collaborate and implement direct specific support for students earlier in the school year. Um, has the PLMs or Professional Learning Mondays have an impact providing these supports? So this survey was given to teachers in January to gauge on the reflect, uh, to reflect on the PLMs thus far. And the opportunity to collaborate goes further than just your teaching partner. It would be your teaching partner, I had written down just specialists, instructional coaches, cross grade level, cross building teachers. And it's a true dedicated time where all teachers are available and if you are talking about instructional practice or curriculum implementation or student growth, the people that you need are available at that time and that's, that's a big deal that you are able to plan ahead of, time, ahead of time. We know this is a teacher directed time, we know this is a building directed time. How can we use the resources that we have to make it better for kids? Thank you. Um, I'm Bob Luciano. I teach fourth grade at Fairmount, and I have to say I'm excited about the slides I get to present because um, being on this committee, it was nice to get the feedback. You know, that's who we were trying to help were the teachers, um, and I heard a lot of great things. But then I and surveys sometimes you're a little bit more honest, so it was nice to really look back and to see um, how the feedback was very similar from what I heard at being at some of these professional learning opportunities. Um, the popular one was definitely the teacher directed days and I can also understand why. Um, teachers appreciate it because it's directed centered around you. Um, for me, for example, that could be working with my fourth grade team looking at curriculum, specifically the science. Um, I typically am a social studies guy so the science was new for me this year so I crave that time. Um, but then sometimes it was I branched away from my team and would utilize the specialists like the resource teacher or the social worker or even our behavior <coughs> specialists in the district to get some strategies. So it was nice because on teacher directed days you kind of know everyone's available. So that is a common trend that we saw in the survey. Um, another trend was what Justin mentioned earlier, um, the curriculum implementation. Um, this is a new year for science so we really needed that time to really look into it. We know math is coming up, we know social studies is coming up. So there's a lot of new coming our way and we really don't want to short end it and just rush into a new curriculum. We want to really be more proactive with these resources so I feel like that's what teachers are saying. Um, the next one that was interesting is the building level days do allow for deeper conversation as Principal Novak mentioned in her presentation you know but we did get some feedback that some teachers felt the topics were redundant so that is definitely a goal area moving forward. I think we have to remember this is new for teachers and it's also new for our principals as well so everyone's trying to figure this out but I feel like we're getting better every Monday people are learning what works and what maybe you shouldn't put on a Monday that needs to be pushed off maybe for a faculty meeting as well. Um, the traveling this one was interesting but the nice thing about this is these surveys really allow for us to make changes and so we got a lot of feedback right away about the traveling and we get an email from Justin kind of saying, hey, I recognize it. These are neighborhood <laughs> schools. I don't want you rushing out to get to these places. And the presenters that are facilitating those, those district level days are more mindful that people are coming and going. And if you're a first grade teacher and your student's not picked up, you're not going, okay, well, goodbye, I have a professional <laughs> learning. You know, the district's <clears throat> definitely um, recognizing that those days we have to be a little bit more flexible. Um, and even today was different. We didn't have to rush out of the building we use technology and we were able to stay in our buildings, all get a professional learning that everyone in the district, um, intermediate for me, all about the t upcoming testing. So that was nice, you know, I didn't feel rushed and it was a great day. I mean, I got a lot of stuff done today and it was, we had a great meaningful conversation. But, you know, the, that's still a challenge we're looking at and I can't speak to middle school, but there is a middle school representative on our committee and they, you know, the middle school periods is something that we're looking into and how we support middle school teachers. Um, differentiating, this is a thing that I feel like every district is trying to work on with professional learning. When you have all these different people in their roles in one room, how do you hit everybody? And I think uh, everyone's doing an amazing job trying to make it specific to our PE teachers, to our speech pathologists, um, to everyone in the building to make sure they are getting some type of learning. Are we perfect at it yet? No. But we are definitely, you know, focusing on this. And then the one thing, focusing on that growth mindset comment earlier, I feel like the staff in this 
district are definitely having a growth mindset. Everyone knows it's a work in progress. They know this is, was not going to be perfect off the bat. And I think that's why we're getting such honest feedback because people want this to get better. So um, I'm going to be able to share with you some specific teacher comments. Um, teachers write a lot. So uh, this is a teacher comment, and I will definitely reflect on it as well. But um, this teacher wrote, teacher director days are very much appreciated and can be very useful for planning and collaborating. District days are tricky. Finding parking and driving from building to building seems to take up a lot of time. It is hard to plan and prepare materials for the, the week when you do not have that Monday after school. It is also hard to make decisions as a grade level when north and south side schools are not present because um, they have been separated. And it would be helpful if each grade level could meet at the same school on these days. So this is definitely something we're reflecting on. Um, I can definitely acknowledge this teacher and say I too had to adjust. My Mondays were to get everything kind of ready to go. Now I do that on Fridays. But it was something that I had to personally figure out for myself. So I think this teacher is being very honest that it is, you know, everyone's making sacrifices, judging, juggling around their schedules to make this work. But it's great that they provided this feedback because sometimes we, you know, you may look over this um, and how can we support these teachers. Um, I love this one. This one is great because um, I agree with it really well. Um, uh, I love this one. I, and so I have been through the implementation of a new curriculum in District 58 in the past, and I've always felt that teachers were stressed out and confused on the resources, um, assessments, and the pacing of the new materials. However, this year has been completely different. We have more time to talk about the resources, get answers to the questions we have, talk amongst other teachers in our grade level, and problem solve through the challenges as they come up right away. I feel this has been a much smooth transition into a new curriculum as we have so much more time to break it up, to break it down into manageable PD time. Um, I, I completely agree just because I feel like this year we are having proactive discussions with curriculum where in the past, it was more reactive. It was, oh, wow, we went several months, everyone was struggling with this, okay, let's fix it now. I, I mean, I feel like we are catching things and this is, we're, we're really working together. We're not just depending on the piloted teachers. It's very um, uniformed. And I, I feel like there's more consistency when we sit these with the other fourth grade teachers on my end. Like, we're all on the same page. And so that's been very helpful. And I feel like, as Justin mentioned, the confidence is going up. There was a lot of teachers worried about teaching science who have never taught it before. Um, and you're seeing them enjoy it. And I think next year is going to be hard when their teammate can't get it all back because now they're going to want to keep teaching it. But just going forward, I think this approach is perfect when we look at a new math and new social studies. Um, and it's nice to see that this particular teacher also feels the same way. Next, I'm going to pass it off to Katie, um, who will focus on the parents. Thank you. Uh, I'm Katie Herkus and a member of the Professional Learning Council, um, also a parent in District 58, so I get to share with you some of the feedback from the parents. There was a lot of feedback um, on the survey that came not only about um, the Professional Learning Mondays, but it was the same one about the calendar. So a lot of people had a vested interest and we feel like we had um, a nice representative representation of our community. And the first question that we asked, and really we were wanting to know is what impact were these professional learning Mondays, Mondays having on our families. Um, we know that we took a, kind of a risk in doing this and um, we were pretty happy with what we saw that we didn't expect that there was going to be no impact on families. That would have been unreasonable of us to have that expectation. But as you can see here, um, close to half say that there was a minimal impact um, and even those that said a two or a three were significant. We know that we want to help support in other ways that we can those that did say there was a significant impact. And so we're going to look at some of the comments and share with you um, some of the things. We know that a big piece of this moving forward is our communication. And we did a lot of communication last year, um, but we recognize that we need to continue that communication even though to our council and maybe to those that are involved it may end up seeming repetitive, but we know that we're going to hit other families along the way. Um, so the other question that we asked was, do you feel that District 58 has thoroughly communicated the value of these Mondays and the impact on student learning? Um, having been around communication is a huge piece and we know we're going to continue to work on it. So the majority said yes, we had communicated um, thoroughly. Our comments would tell us that there's still other things that we need to continue to communicate or re-communicate. 
Um, so the increased communication that we've already discussed is why do we have these on these Mondays? So as a council, you know, we feel like we're kind of talking again, but we do need to get that out there, that we chose Mondays because that was the day of the week that there were the most interruptions to already. Um, although we couldn't be fully aligned with District 99 due to transportation of being um, a late start, we thought that having the whole community on a Monday might help in some way. Um, and then that other big piece is just what actually happens. How does it benefit um, my child when, when they're let out of school an hour early? So those are our really three big points that we want to hit. Some of the comments that we saw were probably the most overwhelming one was additional child care options from Mondays until 3 p.m. Um, and I can say that as a parent, I lucked out because my child attends Champions, and so that just was natural. But for many, many other families, that was not the easy route that they had to go. And so um, we are, we're hearing that feedback. Um, and then that last quote on there, or the quote at the bottom, I think was the overwhelming message that we received from parents, that they're willing to accept this impact and the inconvenience if it's truly working um, for our teachers. And I think as you heard from Shore and Bob, we do feel it's working. And so our next step is that we need to communicate that with our families. Um, I have two quotes also to share from parents, and um, you can take them in and reflect on them how you will. We've reflected as well, but I think ultimately it just tells us that we're going back to how we're communicating and what we're communicating <coughs> to parents. So the first one says, explain to parents exactly how the time will be used each week. On some Mondays, I've seen teachers leave the school immediately after the bell rings. Maybe they're going to a different school for professional learning, or maybe they're taking advantage of getting out of work an hour early. It costs us more out of pocket to pay for extra childcare expenses due to the early dismissal. I want to know why. Um, so these parents do have the right to know what we're doing. Um, we are very confident in what we are doing, but we do need to communicate that as well. And to be sure they're not taking advantage of that. <laughs> they are going to the school. <laughs> Get that in the verbal round. <laughs> <laughs> I do think, too, going back to that, that our teachers have communicated that. I was um, at a PTA meeting for my children's school, and when this did come up, I was sure to say, like, we are hearing that feedback, but please know that we're getting in our cars right away to head to another school, because we do want to take advantage of the time that we have. We, Although we know it's predictable and how much we have, we are trying to use every minute of that. So um, once we know that our students are taken care of, we are on our way to where we need to go. And then the other two quotes that we want to share with you is that please share data with the parents and community on uh, the decrease in teachers getting subs for teacher in-service committee meetings, poll out days, etc. I see the value in the two uh, clock dismissal schedule as long as there's less professional development types of sub use compared to previous years. Um, Jane's going to discuss that in a moment, um, but that does go back to some of our communication just about what does our um, overall picture of professional learning look like. And then finally, I support early release on Mondays for the teachers to get more consistent training. I'm a bit unclear on the need for so many full day in-service training days still prevalent in the schedule. So at that, thank you for listening to both the student or the parent and teacher feedback. And Jane's going to take over and share some about um, our sub usage. All right, as we look at our substitute teacher usage, one of the things um, that we discussed last year was the possibility that with the Mondays and having the consistent time, we can look at ways to reduce the amount of time teachers are out of the classroom. We were very careful last spring not to overpromise because we knew we need to live through, we, we can set our plans, but we didn't want to, again, overpromise. Um, so for 1920, for this school year, we did reduce one of our grade level meetings, which would be a, a half day, all the kindergarten teachers together, all the first grade teachers, so there's about 25 teachers subbed out on a given day. We, we reduced one of those meetings to go into this year. We also looked at our curriculum committees and meetings in our trying, and did decrease in some areas. We also looked at committees that we didn't need to um, continue to have regular meetings. For example, our, our report card committee would be one that we could call together if we needed to, but we, we pulled some of the committee meetings out of the schedule for this year. Um, we definitely are recognizing that there's more work to do in this area. And so I, we reduced pulling staff out of the classroom for meetings. The, what you will notice in, in the, the curriculum committee meetings, we have um, definitely more control over. 
the when you're looking at the special education meetings and the collaboration meetings and the data meetings and that amount of time where we are using subs floater subs across our school so teachers can have the opportunity to collaborate to work with specialists and to make plans for individual children um, that is that has not decreased during the school year it's definitely something as we look to our targeting our substitute reduction for the future uh, we want to continue to look at we absolutely are committed to decreasing the amount of time teachers are out of the classroom and so we want to explore in this upcoming year we want to continue to tackle what can that look like how can we um, decrease even more maybe reorganize some of the Mondays to capture that meeting time so as we look at those areas again for the future reductions for the upcoming school year some of our middle school work can be accomplished on the Mondays we don't need to continue that structure where we substitute and substitute teachers at the middle school um, we are in hopes of some of our committees ultimately sunsetting um, ELA and science are just two examples we have other committees that as we look um, again we don't need to have those standing meetings on the calendar we will reduce again for the 2021 school year and, and decrease another grade level meeting and try to work with our staff with professional learning council and with Justin and I to figure out okay how can we still accomplish the benefits of having all 25 teachers at a grade level in the same place to talk about curriculum to talk about instruction assessment strategies um, so that's you know in the works for the upcoming year how we can improve the use of those days um, while still decreasing in this area and then we'll really again <coughs> our team starting with the ASC team we need to continue to work on um, with building schedules and the critical meetings and try to identify some ways we can reduce those whether it's data meetings problem solving meetings um, some of our special services type meetings that we currently have that are again pulling teachers out of the classroom we are very excited and looking forward to next year we want to continue improving on our model some of the areas we're looking toward or looking at are that exploration of a different of additional child care options we definitely re have received that feedback from parents are there you know can the district help explore additional opportunities for something that kids could be doing at from the two to three o'clock time on Mondays so more to come in that area um, can we we are looking at structures to minimize the travel for <coughs> teachers uh, as was mentioned we, we don't want to lose time with travel so could we be a little more creative or use some of our technology to um, reduce that time and have teacher more teachers staying in their locations or traveling um, a shorter distance we as Katie talked about that regular communication to our parent community we we definitely want to do a better job and continue to increase our communication related to what do the professional learning Mondays look like we've started to increase that this year but are looking at putting more um, structures and systems in place for our regular communication so parents have a really good understanding as to what our teachers doing and why is this beneficial for our, our students um, again as I've mentioned that continued focus on decreasing the time teachers are out of the classroom that is definitely a goal and that we will look to have stronger systems or increase the systems in place so that we can reduce our substitute time and then we'll working we'll want to keep working with our professional learning council to get feedback and to in input from our staff to continue to refine and improve these days as well as getting feedback from our instructional assistants you know, they have found um, quite a bit of benefit by being included in a number of they, they themselves are getting training specific to their roles as well as having that opportunity to work with our teaching staff specific to some of the students that they're working with or some of the programs they support and finally this slide is really a repeat this is from last year looking at those quotes as we um, began to explore this consistent model why is this professional learning model we're choosing why do we feel it's effective why what's important and how it, it will benefit children so we included um, those quotes again and then our, finally if our board members have any questions for me or for Justin we are happy to answer questions at this time Thank you very much for um, putting this together because I think a lot of the board you know we're really excited about this but wanted to have follow-up to make sure that we're constantly checking to see that it's 
effective and it's what we set out to do my question is on as far as communication um, you said that um, or somebody I forgot who said that the plan was to to better communicate um, with the parents is there a plan in place or is that just you know, you know that there that's an issue and you're gonna work towards it or is there already a plan in place and how you're communicating it like for instance principals this year most building principals now have a communication a weekly thing which is fantastic um, that across the board every school is getting that kind of message is that something that could go in the Monday message like the print like I don't know how far out you guys are planning your professional Mondays but if you know that week that this is the topic could that be in the thing because if it comes from a principal parents are inclined to read it and that is actually one example of an, a step we're putting in place that we started this year um, in that it wasn't in all newsletters and our principals are starting based on this feedback we have a number of principals now who are adding that piece to their weekly newsletter and will continue to work as a team I think an admin team to, to identify you know is that a consistent across all 13 schools <coughs> as of you know, this week that I don't know but that is exactly what we're working toward is where will those consistent communications come from and, and spelling out exactly what like say that we're to this week we are talking about science right well in balancing what well, we're also <coughs> I think still working on and I'm sorry Justin feel free to jump in um, you know we have our bi-weekly communication as well to stay up from the district office so is it a district day does it belong in the district communication as well as the principal communication um, the community communication so you know, I feel like I think our current plan is just more the truth is a lot of the answers to the questions that were asked by parents are on our website and work I, I mean I want to be careful that it doesn't sound like we didn't communicate a lot of this out over the course of the past year we did right. but what the feedback tells us is it, it didn't all get there or it needs to keep coming and so I think we need I to think, feed it so we need I think, to I think feed it, will, it to them as yeah. opposed to having a parent and expecting them to go because right. sometimes it's difficult in my opinion on the website to know where you're looking or yep. where you should be looking for it and yeah. so just having it come from being fed to them just will eliminate the going to look I feel like as we start next year we will have a very clear bulleted plan of these are going to be the different I know w ways that we're communicating to our parents um, that I can't speak as clearly to right now okay thank yeah, you and, and one other thing I like to mention is I get a lot of feedback from the community about we ask for a lot of surveys and so when we we get this feedback I, you know I was actually impressed with the level of detail and I think there's some some great insights but I, I think we need to be mindful to make sure that we do have that communication push to to make sure that we are taking that feedback and taking action so if we kind of swing the pendulum to you know re-communicating things or over communicating I think that's the lens that we should look through it feels like that to us because we are living you know you live it every day but to a parent that you need to hit them over the head like a, a million times to sink in Thank you. Yes. Thank so I will um, echo something that Tracy said just about the importance of this conversation and, and, and why we as a board are, are appreciative of having it. I had a great conversation with the stakeholder immediately before the meeting at our, at our coffee session about just the, the um, being very careful with how we use our, our financial resources. And so um, this is not, not a huge investment in terms of dollars and cents, but this is a huge investment of our time, our teachers' time, our students' time, our families' time. But I'm really thankful to, to the team for coming tonight to talk to, about it, talk to us about it because in any investment, we expect to have a return, and, and I'm, I'm pleased to uh, see some of the things we're seeing tonight. Um, my questions are related to uh, slide five. Specifically, um, we talk about three observable, three observable areas, fidelity of curriculum impl implementation, time to discuss students and groups of students, and uh, teacher self-efficacy. Um, so one thing I was going to ask was how do you measure um, fidelity of curriculum implementation? That, that's a great question that ha would be like a dissertation length answer but I think what you I just but the brief version should. is it, a lot of it begins with with um, being able to walk into a classroom and see that the the the, the, the resource or the, or the learning is be, is happening as it's intended and I mm -hmm. think especially in the first year of a resource implementation we, we really are hoping to see teachers kind of there, there is an adherence to this is what the resource is asking us to do we go through that for that first year so that then we can look for and identify gaps and, and make improvements there so so one piece of it is truly just hearing from our teachers yes I'm doing this this is how this worked for me and that's mm -hmm. where we just had um, our science committee meetings last week 
and that was a big part of the conversation. How is it going for you? What are you hearing from your colleagues? And that, I mean, one of my questions to each grade level was, what more do we need to do to ensure the, fidel the fidelity of implementation? And the responses were really essentially keep on doing what we're doing because there really is a sense that teachers, again, have the time and space and are actually going forth and doing it because all of our teachers will want to do the very best they can for their kids at every point. And so that does look like just, again, having the time to understand and fully walk through it. And then the accountability on that, again, is, is administrative oversight and walking through and having those conversations as well as I think we've, we're, we're in a place where teachers are very straightforward with us. One of the conversations we had <coughs> in the Science Committee was there's not necessarily enough days in the school year to get through every single lesson in this first year. So what do we do about that? How do we make a conscious decision rather than you know a, an uninformed decision? And that's a reality, again, of a new implementation. It just takes longer when you're doing something for the first time. So it, it is in, I know a lot of times we talk about it's in the conversations, but it, it really is in the conversation because people are, our teachers are sharing from a place of, of honest reflection. Here's where I'm at, here's how it's going, and, and here's what I need to, to make sure that that fidelity is there. So like aside from <coughs> collecting teacher voice data on um, my perceptions of my abilities to, to implement initiative X, you have um, staff leaders who are walking through classrooms um, collecting uh, walkthrough data just saying collecting information on like, maybe like a checklist you know this is there, this is this is common or this is in this is um, emerging this is developed in, in classrooms and something that's kind of how we have I, I wouldn't say that we like necessarily have that uniform checklist mm -hmm. I would say that we have our, our building administrators as well as our curriculum coordinators who are coming from that initial supportive lens of walking through and, 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 and seeing what is happening and if it's not offering suggestions or support in terms of how is there a way we can help but, but for the most part we're not hearing the we need support that's not we're hearing people excited to see hands-on science happening mm -hmm. in classrooms um, one other thing I'd, I'd like to see more of, and, and this is this is my my take from your presentation. So if I if I miss something, um, please feel free to correct me. But um, it seemed like when you're collecting data on uh, a teacher's sense of self-efficacy, if I heard the presentation correctly, you were um, measuring that maybe on a Tuesday, immediately following. But I'd be curious to know. Um, how do I, how efficacious are the teachers feeling one week later, one month later? I mean, I, mean, I know there's, there's so many things going on, I mean, like, but maybe um, the, the Tuesday after discipline with dignity, we might all feel jazzed about it, but then, you know, teachers are, are very, very busy. They have a lot on their plate. Um, is there still that, that inertia um, longitudinally? So one of the ways that we've addressed that is we have the weekly exit slip, which is really designed to give us that each time, how are we doing, how did this particular Monday go for everyone? And we really do have most, I mean, I would say 90 something percent response every Monday from, from staff. The other, um, one of the slides had only 137 responses, if you m might notice. And so that was what we, we sort of developed a, a summative exit slip, if you will. It's much more open-ended. That one's also anonymous. And so we allow teachers to give us feedback a couple of, or we ask teachers, I should say, to give us feedback a couple of times each year in that more longitudinal way. So those are the questions where we say, here are the goals. This is the slide uh, that, that I'm referring to. We didn't put all of them in, but here are the goals we established last year when we talked about these Mondays. How are we doing in terms of reaching those goals? And then the next question, is always if, if, if we did it uh, you know if you can share more and if we didn't do it how can we do better and so we are we are trying and those one of the things we looked at when we did the anonymous survey was there was there was always some question of are you getting the same level of um, honest response that you are from a survey with a, the teacher's name attached and as as the person who reads through and I and you know my my colleagues if you're going to test who really does read through religiously every single response every Monday the responses that came in I mean you could almost match them up because there was just a consistency of language and whether it's effusive praise or whether it's constructive criticism it was it, it, it bears out both in the weekly and in the in the overall so I think there is definitely some, some consistency there but we intend to offer that open-ended slip at least once if not twice more this year as we're planning for next year well, thank you so much to all five Sorry, of you for more coming. One of the things that I, I heard is uh, how do we tell, how do we explain the value? And I think uh, if you talk to most parents, the how do we explain the value to parents? Uh, if you talk to most parents, they're very happy with their student's classroom teacher um, or have high praise for their student's classroom teacher uh, often. Um, and the value of reduced sub-usage uh, as a way 
the, the moment that a parent can repeat the value to another parent is when you know you've uh, sold the value of these professional learning Mondays. And so finding a way to like quantify, uh, even if it's in the simplest form of, my student now has 20% more time with their teacher that they didn't have in the 2018-19 school year. If we can have that level of benchmark data of saying, in the 2019-20 school year, we've been able to make sure our teachers are in the classroom X percent more often because of the professional learning Mondays, um, or X more minutes of classroom teaching time. Something that's tangible that you can repeat to your next door neighbor who's also a parent saying, I really like the fact that my, even though my kid has to leave school one hour early on Monday and I have extra childcare, I know that over the course of the school year, this is how much more time they have with their teacher because of that space. Uh, so some way to simplify and deliver the value. I also agree with the comments from my, my peers up here, um, so I won't repeat any of those, but that one felt like some way to tangibly uh, deliver the value or explain the value to our parents. Go ahead. Yeah. One thing really quick, sorry. Um, also agree with that. It's just one to talk last night. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Good, good. Okay. Um, sorry, also sorry. agree with a lot of the comments that other people have said, but I just wanted to make one more um, point that I appreciate um, the honesty of the feedback you guys gave us tonight. You did not just feed us the sunshines and rainbows of how this is the best thing we've ever done, but also <coughs> here's the challenges. Like we are experiencing a lot of positivity from this, but there are still things we need to improve. And I appreciate that <coughs> honesty. Um, and just to me, it feels more real, real that way. It feels more um, authentic. And I really appreciate that. And I think a lot of others would, would probably Did agree. Well, I feel bad that I have an answer. <laughs> Here we go. It's okay. So I am just, so the questions about the how valuable was today's on um, seven and eight, mm -hmm. um, those are ones with names on them. That, so is anything being done or to get more feedback from the hundred and, I don't know, 165, 170 people who don't think that these are at all valuable? Yes. What? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, in a variety of ways. You know, sometimes you'll see a theme where there was something. Well, you know. Like well, and I mean, are. one of the examples too is when we talk about the district-wide rollouts of things. Like that is that is by its very nature not super differentiated, right? That's a moment where we're saying we want everyone to have this baseline, which means some of you are hearing a repeat, and and some of you know. So those are days where we often get a you know not super valuable for me. I already kind of knew that, and so we recognize that, and we don't you know there, there's value to the consistency of message there's also value for us in thinking about how we deliver that. So often there are themes. If there are individual moments where someone has a, you know, a, a really strong uh, or a really negative experience, we, we do try to follow up. I mean, you know, it, it's a delicate thing because you don't, want, you don't want anyone to feel like they're being <coughs> questioned for their honest feedback. But we really do try to, again, we're trying to create that culture where we can say, tell me more, how can we do this better? And, and I mean, I've personally had a number of conversations with teachers after reading comments. And, and it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mutually appreciated conversation because we're, we're really not, you know, we, I believe, we all believe this is valuable, but it will, if it loses its value or if people start to perceive a loss of value, then it, it, it's going to become tough to, to want to continue this. And so just to stave that off, we have to make sure that we are listening to and responding to and talking with the people that are, that are giving those ones and twos. Most often those ones and twos are accompanied by an open-ended comment, which is really helpful. And so then we can kind of get an idea of is this a system problem or is this an individual scenario. Can, you can grab a seat, but I, I did want to say real quick that thank you to all five of you for um, for walking us through all that. It was it was very thorough and and really important because um, these proactive conversations and the feedback that we're getting back is is really important to me for a couple of reasons. One, we're asking a lot of our teachers with this year after year implementation of new curriculum, and so this ongoing and consistent opportunity for them to to walk through this is really really important and um, I'm glad to hear that we're getting so much positive feedback and learning uh, going forward on that because one of the things the big concerns that I had when we started talking about this is is I'm friends with teachers in other districts on social media and the number of cynical memes I see about P P PD time is is rather upsetting so I want to make sure that we're uh, always constantly looking to what we're doing and making sure that our teachers are as excited as we're seeing right now and in, in year one that we're constantly listening and learning um, uh, to move forward and the one thing I would add on to um, Karat's um, metric part is if, if there's a way that we can talk about the level of, of implementation that we're doing 
the quickness in which we're implementing some of our, our new uh, curriculum and, and we're and how we've used those days to help roll that out I think that would be really really beneficial because I people are really excited about that but I think also a little bit nervous about it as, as well so thank you very much uh, for the entire presentation um, next up we have a, another spotlight in our schools with the school environment survey results with Megan Hewitt <coughs> Good evening. Uh, I know we've been talking a lot about feedback this evening. Uh, well, here you go some more. <laughs> I'm, it's my pleasure to share with you tonight the results from this year's Parent School Environment Survey. In December, District 58 invited parents to take two surveys. Um, the first is the state's five essential survey. That survey is actually still open right now. It closes this Friday. Um, the other survey we administered was our district created school environment survey. Um, it closed right before winter break and the benefit to that survey is we received the results immediately. Um, so this year, uh, once again, we offered it in two languages and we received a little over 1100 responses. Um, it's pretty consistent, it's a little bit down from last year, but it's still more than um, the number of responses we've received in years prior to that. Uh, the survey comprises um, a quantitative section of 19 questions that focus mostly on the school environment and social emotional learning um, and then two open-ended questions we know um, parents have uh, comments and um, suggestions that extend beyond the school environment and social emotional learning so we want to give them an opportunity to share something that we're doing well and something where we can improve so, um, and then lastly, we will be posting um, all of the results to our school website, gg58.org slash surveys, um, sometime tomorrow. So that's, you know, we always post those survey results and that's just to be transparent with the community and um, keep our community informed on what um, our survey results are. So uh, first, taking a look at the quantitative results um, and looking at the results this year compared to last year. Over half of the questions had identical um, parent satisfaction scores um, as compared to the year before, which is pretty consistent. And then looking at the remaining questions, um, there were a, a couple that improved and um, decreased by 1%, a couple that increased by 2%, and there was one question that decreased by 3%. Um, and I'll be addressing that one a little bit more later on. But overall, a lot of great consistency year after year. Um, 20, we've been offering the survey for many, many years. Um, in 2015, we revamped it. We had a slightly different uh, rating scale, and we uh, updated some of the questions. So we consider 2015 to be the baseline year. And when you compare the results from our most current survey to 2015, we've, every single question has shown improvement. Um, so that's a really big positive. It shows that over um, longitudinally, we're doing a lot better. Um, so I'll be going over a few of the quantitative questions just to give you an idea of where we're at, uh, especially compared to the past five years. This first question is, my child is getting a quality education at this school. We're pretty proud of this, uh, of this response because not only did we improve uh, this by two percentage points, it's also the highest uh, uh, satisfaction or the highest percentage of parents who responded with always or usually um, since we started the survey. So some good news there. Uh, the next couple of questions, um, really, it's kind of interesting. Historically, they show the exact same satisfaction. My child is cared for by adults at this school, got 95%. And this school is a supportive and inviting place for students, also got 95%. These results are pretty steady <coughs> throughout the past five years. Um, and they're really terrific numbers. I mean, 95% of our parents say their kid is cared for and supportive, um, supported at school always or usually. So that's a pretty powerful statement, I think. Um, touching very directly on social emotional learning, when we asked parents for their perception of how their child's school teaches SEL, um, we had a 92% response, um, satisfaction response, and that is pretty consistent year after year. Uh, with a 4% um, increase since 2015. Parent feedback is something that was 
very important in our strategic plan in improving um, the parent feedback that we receive and how we respond to it. So we've been making a concerted effort to improve um, the opportunities for parent feedback. Um, this year we had 77% of parents say always or usually to this question. It's the same response as last year, so we do still have some room to grow. Um, but it is nice to see, compared to 2015 where we started, we have gone up six percentage points in this area. Uh, and I think this is an area where our school leaders and our district leaders are really working to improve. My Child's School Fosters an Appreciation of Student Diversity and Respect for Each Other. This is the question that showed a decrease of 3%. Um, we're, we're taking this question very seriously and we're really looking into um, why this could have happened. Um, looking at last year, we had a very high um, always or usually response, 95%. That was um, an increase of 4% in one year. So I don't know if last year was an outlier, but it is something we are taking a serious, serious look at. Um, not, that's not connected to this question, but um, I think Karen mentioned this too. We had um, uh, the DuPage ROE uh, come out to our principal, principal meeting recently and present to us on cultural bias. And I believe they're also in the process of giving um, a related presentation to all of our faculty as well. But um, this is an area that we'll continue to focus on. Um, communication is another big component of the strategic plan. And uh, teacher communication has remained fairly steady over the past few years um, for parent satisfaction. Oh, and that was the last um, open-ended que or quantitative question um, for this part of the presentation. And then all of those survey results will be posted on the website tomorrow. Now looking at the open-ended questions, um, the first one was what is one thing District 58 and or your school does well that you would like us to continue? Uh, just under half of the parents who, uh, who took the survey responded to this question. I took a look at every single individual comment and I gave it um, a theme, assigned it anywhere from one to three themes depending on the content of the comment um, to sort of better quantify the feedback we received in the qualitative comments because people provided a lot of really helpful positive feedback for this question, constructive criticism in the next. Um, so this was just one effort to break down some of the responses we received. Um, the most common topic was communication. Um, it was very broad in the types of comments. They addressed teacher communication, principal and district communication. Um, a lot of parents really appreciate Seesaw. Um, a new expectation would be uh, due to the strategic plan that we, um, the, the district started with principals this year was having principals maintain a weekly newsletter. Parents really like this. Um, and they all, parents also mentioned this email communication and then student performance uh, feedback appreciating that. Um, our parents really love the caring and supportive environment in our schools. There were a lot of comments that addressed this. You could just, um, it was really heartwarming to see some of these comments about how, um, you know, how whether it be academics or other areas, uh, parents were pretty happy with their child's experience. Curriculum was also a common topic. Um, parents were happy with the amount of rigor that their child received. Other parents were impressed with um, the differentiation opportunities, meeting kids at levels above and below grade level. Good teachers and staff, there were 60 comments that were the main focus was on teachers and staff. Teachers and staff were mentioned in many other comments um, as well. You can really tell uh, District 58 parents love their teachers and staff here in District 58. Um, but I, when I'm trying to figure out how best to present the information, um, there were 60 comments where the focus was truly teachers and staff, but they want to make it known that there were more um, comments where teachers and staff were mentioned, as well as um, school leaderships and the district. <coughs> um, social emotional learning was a popular topic. Um, parents seemed pretty happy with that uh, curriculum in their schools. Um, instructional technology was also mentioned, most frequently uh, Seesaw, the use of instructional technology and using Seesaw. Um, parents appreciate the opportunity to 
get involved with their schools um, in different parent activities, family activities, um, education opportunities. Um, and then lastly, sense of community. Um, that kind of ties in with the caring and supportive environment, but this one was more focused on um, the school's effort to make everyone belong, including families, siblings, parents, etc. The other open-ended question was, what is one thing District 58 uh, or, and or your school could improve upon? Um, we had the exact same response rate to this question as we did for the first one, just under 50%. Um, and now looking at those themes, um, the most common theme was curriculum. Um, uh, very similar to some, some of the positives people said was, were also some of the, uh, the areas for growth, including some parents wanting more rigor. Um, there was also some um, differences in opinion. There were some parents that said they wanted more homework for their children, others who said less homework. Um, there were quite a few mentions of Specialist classes like art, music, and PE, and parents um, wanting more of those, more time for those classes. Um, there were a few comments regarding the gifted program and um, maybe wanting enhanced experiences or different opportunities for students who are accelerated. Communication came up a lot as well um, at all different levels, all different types of communication. Um, a common theme was parents who want more communication when there is an issue going on in a classroom or in a school um, or just wanting more uh, regular communication about their students' academic progress. Facility maintenance and upgrades, another area of our strategic plan, um, was also a common topic. Um, that no surprise, air conditioning was the most common topic um, related to facility planning. There were 20 specific, 20 different parents who mentioned um, us wanting us to um, get air conditioning for our schools. Parent involvement, um, this was very similar to last year if I recall. Um, some parents expressed some frustration that there weren't more opportunities in the evening for them to get involved. Some of our schools have a lot of events during the day um, concert, like music concerts, that sort of thing, um, and that isn't always conducive to a parent's schedule. Uh, school and class size, uh, another comment that came up a lot last year too, uh, where some parents said that they felt the classes were too large um, and their school was overcrowded. All things that I know we're all aware of already and working on finding some solutions uh, for, especially through facility planning. And then the last thing that emerged was student discipline uh, mostly this was parents who um, want a stronger discipline policy in schools um, or perhaps a little bit um, had some expressed some concerns about classroom disruptions due to student discipline. So what's next? Um, all of our principals received their uh, full school uh, survey results <coughs> and all of our district central administrators received the district's um, results um, for all of our schools. So our schools, our principals, and their building leadership teams are reviewing those school-specific results to inform their school improvement plans. And then our central administrators uh, are working jointly with our schools to make improvements on a more district-wide level. Um, and then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, all the data will be posted online. Um, we, as always, we are uh, redacting any identifiable information. Um, we won't want to put any person on the spot or embarrass anyone, but we're, um, but all that, all those comments will be put online tomorrow so the, com the community can better understand the feedback. That is a quick snapshot. Um, any questions? There's, there's one question on here that I, where I feel like the always versus usually is an important thing to differentiate between. The mm -hmm. school is a supportive and inviting place for our students. I think I'll speak on behalf of myself. Um, that that feels like our bar should be always. If, if there's a time where it's usually, which means sometimes a student walks into the school and doesn't feel supportive or invited into the building, um, that's a concern. And so just monitoring whether the always versus usually is trending in the right direction uh, is an important one for us. I, I, I don't know what the historical data look like. And the numbers are obviously very strong in the always and usually combined. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to be able to see the usually continue to wind down yeah. and the always continue to wind up. Um, yeah. And figuring out why that is, that why we're getting usually there, or if it's turning the wrong direction, to, to understand that there, that there's an area for improvement. Mm -hmm. 
that's a great point. <coughs> I think looking at that question um, next to the, um, I'm a, my child was cared for by adults, I re recall seeing while they had the same combined um, <coughs> percentage of 95%, there was some discrepancy between one having a much greater number of always than the other. So um, that did stand out to me. And if, if you'd like, I can get some of the historical data for that particular question and we can see if, if that's consistent with the past few years. Um, and if not, um, we can brainstorm some ways to improve that area. Thanks. Comments? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, so Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Brian. All right, listed on tonight's agenda are five communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? And with that, we'll move on to reports of the board and we'll go ahead and start with Dr. Russell's superintendent report. I'll try and shorten it as much as we can just because the, it's already looking at 8 30, but. Um, on behalf of the Board of Education, I want to thank Pastor. I thought you did a great job with your presentation. So Karen and Katie, thank you. Thank you to your wonderful students for their presentation, uh, the PTA, and then also the Lester Playground Group. Uh, just amazing news, and we're so proud of Lester. So thank you. You had a great showcase tonight for your school. I want to remind parents that we will have an additional meeting this month. It's a curriculum workshop on February 24th. We encourage everyone to come out. It will be at Hillcrest School at 7 p.m. It is a curriculum workshop similar to what we would have had two years ago at Puffer, where parents will actually be able to go through professional development sessions, which was very um, highly received last time we did that. And so I would encourage everyone to come out to that if they're able to do so. Also, just want to remind the board and highlight something in Justin's presentation. At the Countywide Institute on February 28th, our teachers who are teaching math, that will be the first training day for the um, new math curriculum if the board approves that this evening with the resources. So we're very excited about that coming up. I want to highlight something in finance. Um, the district received notice from the state of Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, which is DCEO, last week that we were finally authorized to apply for the first of the school playground projects. Uh, we were notified that El Sierra would be uh, allowed to go ahead first with its funding for $180,000. Um, why El Sierra? Why did they get to go first? Well, really, that's not up to the school district. That's up to the state of Illinois. Um, we prioritize based on um, safety, condition, pea gravel, all sorts of those things, the ability for a school to raise its funds. All of our schools are on that list, and so we're waiting to receive notification from the state, but we are very pleased that um, we did get initial <coughs> notification. I do want to remind everyone, this is just step two out of three. Step one was just getting on the list. Step two is being notified that you get to apply. The important step is step three, and so we're still not at step three, but it does appear like it's a very good sign that we're moving in the right direction. So we want to uh, especially thank Representative Saba Murray for making sure that our schools got on that list and, and started moving. So we hope that many of our other schools will also be notified in a you know, quick uh, time frame. Uh, we could anticipate, though, that this could take several years. This money is coming from state bonds, and um, as you know, uh, the state of Illinois is significantly backlogged with its bills. So just because you get to apply does not mean that that money is coming anytime soon, but it is moving in a positive uh, direction. Speaking of facilities, uh, District 58 Citizen Task Force met on January 22nd to discuss our facility needs and whether the district should consider moving to a 6-8 middle school model for grade level configuration. I want to emphasize with our community that no decisions have been made. I have received several calls and um, emails about when would my child move over to the middle school. And I remind everybody I love the enthusiasm, but we're a little uh, ahead of schedule there with, with that. Uh, we have not made any decisions in terms of um, any you know funding or anything like that. On February 3rd, the school board did hold a special meeting last week. It was a very productive meeting. And based on the feedback received from the task force, the school board recommended that the task force wait to launch its facility planning engagement effort and instead reconvene in early March to more fully develop viable facility plans and continue to prioritize the different options. The task force will meet at Leicester School on March 2nd from 6.30 uh, p.m. to 8.30 p.m. After the meeting, uh, staff and community members will be informed of the next steps. I would encourage everyone to please visit the community uh, tab or the facilities tab on our website. I want to thank Member Weiner. She had a really good idea that we make that one of the home tabs on the website. 
everything that goes out to the citizen task force is up there. All of the letters that we send out to them, all of the materials, we want our community to have the exact same information that the task force has. I want to thank all of our employee groups for um, being represented on the task force and, and really taking the time to meet with me individually as well to go over those things. So um, thank you very much. I see Katie back there. Katie, thank you as well for um, always taking part in that. But again, no decisions have been made for the task force. Um, we are continuing to work through how do you prioritize all the things that were called for in the strategic plan. And again, thank you for our board for taking uh, the time to really discuss that. That tape, or listen to me, tape, the audio from that meeting is available. Um, and you can find that on our district's website. There are no more tapes. <laughs> Okay, uh, personnel. Um, it is bittersweet, but Robin Bruback, the principal of Indian Trail, is retiring at the end of this school year, and the search for a new principal for Indian Trail is underway. In fact, just this morning, we had our first round of interviews. We will go through the full interview process, and at the next board meeting in March, we hope to have a recommendation for the Board of Education for the Indian Trail principal position. So that is moving along uh, very quickly. It still sounds strange to say March, but believe it or not, that's a few short weeks away. Um, technology. Justin Sissel and Dr. Eichmiller have uh, sent out a communication to all families about NWEA. Um, I want to make it really clear to our community that NWEA's uh, data for the winter testing um, was almost entirely accurate except for the growth projections. Um, I want to compliment uh, Mr. Sissel and Dr. Eichmiller. They noticed that some of the growth projections weren't fully accurate and they inquired with NWA as to why. And NWA assured both of those individuals on January 10th that the data was accurate and you can go ahead and present that to the Board of Education, which is exactly what we did. Um, after further review, it was still clear that they did not have a uh, accurate um, account of all of the information. And so we continue to press them. And, and NWA has actually written the district an apology letter. We're not the only district that was in this boat. Um, so all of the achievement data, meaning the RIT score, is accurate. The student's um, percentile in terms of achievement is accurate. What changed for some students was their growth projections from the winter of 19 to the winter of 20. Not all of our students were impacted by this, but a small number of our students were impacted by this. All of the data has been updated in the district squirrel system, so you can go ahead and take a look at that. If you're uh, interested, if you have any questions, you're welcome to contact uh, any of us at the district office. We're very happy to help assist with that. Um, for the Board of Education, as uh, Justin has alluded to in, in his communications, this may change the overall percentages of students meeting uh, their growth target from winter of 19 to winter of 20. So at the Hillcrest meeting later this month, Justin will give the board an updated um, <coughs> review of that data. Again, I can't emphasize enough, though, this, this is an NWA countrywide issue. It's not a District 58 um, issue. Student services, what I'd like to highlight, um, the Building Bridges Parent Community. If you're not familiar with this community, it's, it's a group of uh, parents with special needs. They get together across our district, and they highlight students with special needs. Oh, did I say parents? Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, students with special needs, and they highlight all of the great things that are taking place in our district. They also work collaboratively together uh, to improve the learning atmosphere for their children. And we are very proud of this group. They will be meeting on February 19th at 7 p.m. That will also be at Hillcrest. I encourage anyone to attend. It's a very, very good group. The parents get together. They do a lot of positive things for our school district, and we're looking forward to that meeting. Just some other heads up, on Monday, February 17th is President's Day, so there will be no school. There will also be no school on February 28th, which is the DuPage Countywide Institute Day. And it's hard to believe, but last week we passed the 100th day of school. Um, if you're an elementary parent, that is a very, very big day at our elementary schools. It's a lot of fun. One of the things that I would encourage all to do is to follow us on Twitter, with the hashtag DG58Pride or DG58Learns, to see all of the wonderful things that our teachers do for our students, but especially on the 100th day of school. It is a lot of fun for our younger children, and I would encourage you to check us out on Twitter or Facebook. Um, you can see a lot of really great stuff that's going on in the district. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, on to the monthly business with uh, Dre Fall. Uh, 
So in your year-to-day report, we have four different ways that you look at the, day, the financial data as to how we're trending from prior year and from budget. So you have the, you know, uh, against budget, against prior year, you have the cash balance piece, you've got the variance piece, and then, you know, where we are on cash. And I finished all that up, and I was running, and I was looking at the expense. Revenue came in fine. They were actually, revenues ahead. Then expenses are running like two points ahead of last year at this time. And then I remembered that we got three paychecks in January, which we did not get last year or the year before. We got those three paycheck periods in March. We have 26 pays in the year, so it's every other week. And eventually, you know, it hits at different times of the year. So suffice to say, when you look at the report, you go, wow, we're, not, we're at 58%, and we should be around 50% you know, expense at this point. Uh, that's what the trend shows, but we're a little above that. That's because the payroll is about $2 million. Uh, that is also why you have on your agenda tonight uh, a working cash transfer to education fund. Uh, last year that was done at the March meeting, uh, so we're doing that just a little earlier because of our trend. Overall, though, if you look at, and one, one piece I always look at is a comparison. Um, on a cash basis, we're about a million three behind where we were this year at that time. And you consider the fact that that payroll was $2 million. We had a little higher expense uh, accounts payable this month than we did uh, last year. It all depends on when bills hit. We're in good, we're, we're not in bad position. We're in a good position. So it looks a little skewed, and it's going to look that way for the next couple months. But it'll rec it'll it'll adjust when we hit <clears throat> the same time last year, which would be the March uh, the March time frame when we have those the when we had three paychecks uh, last year. So um, as far as uh, finances overall, we're in good position, um, albeit we look you know as as we are expected because of that payroll piece. Uh, questions on cash flow. You have a few things on your agenda for approval. Actually, you have a lot of things on agenda for <laughs> approval. Uh, Katie's been very busy with bids, so you have a lot of those. Uh, you have the two working cash loans. Uh, working cash is our internal bank, and we do a transfer every year around this time uh, for the funds who have need of those, of those uh, resources. You will repay those back when we have uh, in June when the funds come in from those early tax receipts. Uh, but that is the money we, we make a transfer to, and that's by statute that you have to do that. Uh, so you have a million dollars to the education fund and the rest to, I'm sorry, a million dollars to the transportation fund and the rest to the education fund to cover uh, bills and expenses uh, up until those early tax receipts. Uh, you also have on the agenda uh, the supplemental levy for a debt service. That is to catch us up to um, a level where we're behind. We're running behind on our on our bond debt piece, and there was a memo I think to the board in December about that, and a conversation we had with the uh, finance, um, the FAC. Um, also, you have on there a maintenance grant 50/50 match. We are applying for. Uh, there's money that has been put in the state budget. Um, for a 50-50 match, uh, it's up to $50,000 uh, from the state for maintenance grant work. Um, so the district matches $50,000, uh, the state matches, uh, and we can get some work done. We have uh, we are going to be using capital proceeds for this that we have remaining from the last bond issuance that did the Lester addition and some of the other electrical and fire uh, system upgrades. Uh, there are some interest income and, and a little bit of proceeds left on that uh, if we get the grant, and then we'll do some asbestos abatement uh, that we have that we've been looking at and doing. We're looking for projects that we wouldn't have to undo or anything that would be impactful once we go and work through the, the master's facilities plan. And obviously abatement is always one of those things. Other than that, if there are questions on any of those items. Um, last financial workshop, we talked about just to make sure we were talking about tax and the potential for tax anticipation warrants in May approximately <coughs> is your temperature trending up or trending down on the need to be potentially right. talking about that sooner right now I think we're good okay. right now I mean that's and that was kind of the 
my, my litmus was we spent two million more than expected and we're showing that we're only behind uh, 1.2 or 1.3 million dollars um, that tells me we're in a good position our transportation is trending below expected um, you know and so we'll see how, how things are matching also uh, you know we did receive um, the second of state reimbursements uh, at the end of December we should see another one coming in in the spring um, and that will help as well I mean I don't, we've not every sense is that money has been coming in from the state on a more regular basis than what we had seen in in recent history uh, I think that's a, a focus of you know the, the state has had increase in receipts but they I think they have a focus in making sure that they make those four payments to schools on a timely basis that that help and that's a big, big piece to that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> All right. We'll move on to our policy committee report uh, with Jill Samante. Thank you. Um, we received the first draft of the ISAB. Did I say that right? I A S B. Um, press uh, from. Dr. Russell and we decided and agreed upon uh, splitting us into subgroups mm -hmm. um, and having that our own individual groups done with reviewing those policies uh, by spring break. Um, then IASB will return to do some mm -hmm. final editing. Uh, so we are on time for um, a review to come to the board in June. So that we can implement uh, in the beginning of the school year of 2021. It was a 22, 22. minute meeting. <coughs> so it was great. 2020. 20. Yes. But the meeting was 22 minutes long. Oh, I see. oh, oh okay. 21. 20. For this fall, this school year. Fiscal this year I mean, yeah. sorry, this for next. Yes. Next. Yeah. Yep. Yes. The 20 slash 21, 21 school year. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes. And so I know Member Doshi had a question last time. How will we bring this to the Board of Education? Um, likely, we will bring this to you as a as a wholesale um, adoption. Seven hour marathon meeting. Seven hour marathon meeting. Uh, know that when you approve it, though, you always have the option then of pulling individual ones off if you'd like further consideration, or to continue to revisit that for several meetings after that. Um, so you could avoid that seven hour marathon meeting at once, but know that uh, the policy committee will be having several filters to go through that before it gets to the board. Thanks. Mm -hmm. They're a very trustworthy group. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? All right. Then on to a report from the legislative committee with Kira Doshi. Thanks. Um, I'm <coughs> clearly fighting the last part of the cold here. So appreciate you bearing with me. Uh, we had our Super Bowl this past uh, Friday uh, with the legislative, legislative breakfast. Um, all signs pointed to it was very much appreciated from those that attended and the uh, panel of legislators. Uh, and so just a big thank you to the legislative committee, the members, my co-chair Emily, and um, all the folks that worked behind the scenes, particularly Megan and Melissa, and all the work that you all do to make that a successful event. Um, just to bring everybody that wasn't there into it, uh, we had about, I want to say about 75 attendees uh, from the community and neighboring communities. Um, and we had five legislators or staff attend, uh, which is our biggest turnout in recent history. Um, uh, particularly, uh, the legislators that attended were Senator John Curran, uh, Representative Stava Murray, Representative Tara Costa Howard, Representative Deanne Mazaki, and uh, the district director from Bill Foster's office, uh, uh, on the federal side. Uh, so a great panel, uh, a great uh, set of conversations that were had, particularly around two areas that we wanted to uh, dive into that were relatively, uh, um, are, are relatively um, uh, something that we are, are, is proximate to what we're discussing right now as a, as a board uh, and as a community, uh, particularly around facility needs and then also in terms of, uh, also questions around uh, mental health services and, and building security. Um, and so, uh, uh, it was really helpful to get the legislators' thoughts around what's happening at the state and the federal level around those two particular topics, uh, especially because we can often get caught up in our bubble, which uh, makes a lot of sense, but wanted to make sure that we are uh, following the trend for where, uh, understanding where the rest of the 
state's pulse is around those two particular topics. And I thought it was a very fruitful conversation just to hear their perspective uh, on it. Uh, it also serves as a really helpful uh, gathering uh, to keep our representatives close to us on the topics that are most top of mind. Uh, the uh, legislative committee picks questions uh, that we want to make sure that our rep representatives know are top of mind for us so that when they uh, are engaging with other community members or otherwise uh, at the state level in Springfield or in Washington, um, they're uh, familiar with the things that we're, con we're considering and thinking about. So all in all, successful event. Um, thanks to everyone for their attendance and contributions. Um, we are about to start planning next year's. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you took the time to thank everyone that helped you, but on behalf of us, thank you for your level of work as well, and thank you for hosting as our board's resident comedian. We always appreciate your hosting <laughs> uh, duties. So uh, it was a got, lot of fun. Got to add value somehow. Right? That's right. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> <laughs> That's two today. <laughs> <laughs> We're okay. We're not. Uh, okay. We have to split you guys up. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any questions? All right. The financial advisory committee did not meet um, since the last board meeting. Neither did the district leadership team, but the health and wellness committee did. So, number. Yep. We met on January 16th. We had a, a presentation from Rx Benefits, which is our third party administrator of our, our prescription plan. Um, uh, that presentation really helped us uh, focus on just the increasing cost of, of prescription drugs and how that impacts our our, our revenue. Um, I'm sorry, our, our expenditures. Um, and uh, you know, the, we of course our our um, our committee is representative of not just um, me as the board liaison and our and administrators, but also our, our bargaining groups. And so a lot of the things we're talking about are ways in the future to um, control costs. And there are some things that we could take in the short term, but some of those things need to be done through collective bargaining, which we are in, in the middle of all of our contracts. Um, so, but the, the, we're just having these conversations now, and um, and so that we're um, just ready for the future and, uh, to have some conversations about how to how to cut costs there um, that we can all agree on. Um, we are. We looked at claims. Um, the MRF is running about 5.2 percent to be good through December, and then um, for next for this month, I think we're meeting in next week, Todd, on the tw uh, next Thursday. Um, we are going to be having a conversation about uh, the wellness screen that took place in the fall, and um, and we'll let you know about that next month. Great. Any questions? Wonderful. Then uh, tonight we have no uh, special discussion items. So, uh, what? Um, so now this is an opportunity for members of the audience to share in public comment with the board. But it is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Criticism of individuals is not in order. The board has allotted 30 minutes for public comment this evening. We ask you to keep your comments to a three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. At this time, have we received any cards? Yeah. Okay. We have not received any cards, but if there is someone that would like to speak, please step up to the podium and state your name and your attendance area um, and share your comment. If you do, we do ask that you <coughs> fill out a card with us so that we can follow up with you if, if necessary as well. Thank you. Hi, my name's Emily Gao. Um, I'm a parent at Kingsley. I have a first grader and I have two fourth graders. And um, I haven't been to the board meetings in a while. I used to come all the time and then I had a little break. So I just wanted to say, um, I know it's a lot um, more common that people speak up when they have a criticism or an issue. Um, but I think it's important to speak up when things are going well. So I wanted to say that, um, I wanted to just mention the positive things happening right now. Um, a couple things. I was really happy to learn about the more stringent internet um, safety con um, controls and filters that are being put in place. I think it's definitely moving in the right direction, and I think um, it shows that the district is listening to parents, and I think that's a great thing. Um, also, you know, talking about the extra hour for, for, for professional development for the teachers, you know, um, of course that requires parents to make some accommodations and uh, changes in their schedule but I think overall um, it's you know definitely for the kids best interest if it's for the uh, teachers best interest um, especially with all the different changes and updates in the curriculum I think it's really important that um, they have time to learn it so that they can teach our kids the best um, to their ability um, and also I wanted to focus on the smaller class size um, this was definitely 
you know, my top priority a couple years ago, um, and I spoke a lot about this. Um, and so I just want to be sure I mention the um, positive things that I've noticed having smaller class sizes. Um, I, I know that there are limited resources and limited funding, and keeping that in mind, I think it's definitely still the top priority um, in my book, and I think a lot of parents that you know I know in our community feel the same way. So I just wanted to mention, um, I think this past year and a half has been probably the best experience and best year and a half that um, my family has had at Kingsley, and this is our um, fifth year there. So um, I just wanted to say that I think there are a couple things about it that have just been especially great. Um, you know, Kingsley houses the best program, and I think that makes it a little bit different than some of the other schools. Um, and I think that having that smaller teacher to student ratio is really um, been beneficial for fewer disruptions and uh, more individual attention. And I also think, um, you know, with our neighborhood, we have a lot of new houses being built, a lot of new families moving in. One of the first things they ask is, how's the school? Even though they've done the research before moving there, um, people want to know because there are also, you know, other options, private options. Um, and I'm so happy to say that it's been great. It's been moving in the right direction. Um, you know the the great class sizes and and so on and so forth. Um, this year in particular, we've had three amazing teachers at Kingsley. That's not to say past years haven't been great, but I think that this year in particular, we've had teachers that just seem really well matched. Um, they have such great positivity. I think you know sometimes it's hard if your kids are like, oh, I don't want to go to school, but it's like when you have teachers who are just seem upbeat and positive. I think it makes a huge difference. Um, maybe it's because they have more manageable class sizes, maybe it's because they have, um, you know, more resources with that hour of planning. Um, but overall, I just wanted to take a minute and say I'm really happy with the way things are going, um, and thanks for listening. Oh, and also, please remember this when you're thinking about next year and the year after that in terms of the class size, because um, I'm not the only one that feels this way, um, but I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned those things. Thanks. Thank you so Thank much. You. Anybody else? All right. And then with that, we're going to move on to the approval of minutes. Are there any <coughs> suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? Uh, if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from January 13th of 2020, meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes from January 13, 2020, meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the January 7, 2020, board tour Kingsley traffic safety meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the January 7, 2020, board tour uh, <coughs> and Kingsley traffic safety meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the January 14th, 2020 board tour, Bel Air PTA meeting as presented? So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the January 14th, 2020 board tour, Bel Air PTA meeting as presented. Next up is our consent agenda. Are there any items that a board member would like to have considered separately? Okay, if not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. First up, uh, recommended for action is <coughs> math. K-5 resource adoption of bridges and mathematics is recommended by the math committee. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of bridges in the math ma in mathematics in the quantities defined in the attached quote for a total cost of $354,000? Fifty dollars and twenty-four cents. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? 
just to call out the hard work that went into us reaching this decision. We've had about a year of a preview that this vote would ultimately be coming. Um, and I just really appreciated being kept abreast of the process, throughout the process. Uh, and so this vote for me didn't feel like, one didn't feel like a surprise, but also felt like I didn't have any questions remaining about the, the validity of whether to say yes or no to this vote. And so just thank you for all the hard work. <coughs> Anything else? Right. Well, great. Uh, Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the purchase of the bridges and mathematics and the quantities defined in the attached quote for a total cost of three hundred fifty-four thousand fifty dollars and twenty-four cents. Next up is the math six through eight resource adoption of Big Ideas Math as recommended by the math committee. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of Big Ideas Math in the quantities defined in the attached quote for a total cost of $234,722.67? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samati. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of Big Ideas Math and the quantities defined in the attached quote for a total cost of two hundred thirty-four thousand seven hundred twenty-two dollars and sixty-seven cents. We have a uh, serious safety hazard determination as recommended by the Transportation Review Committee. Is there a motion to award two judgment points to the IDOT a rubric to designate the crossing of Fairview Avenue at 59th Street as a serious safety hazard for O'Neill Middle School? So moved. Second. All right, is there any discussion? I just had a question. <coughs> um, you know, obviously our <coughs> community goes through a lot of change and as a result, traffic and, and roads are, are modified. And we even saw, um, you know, kind of a bullet point in the Lester presentation about traffic patterns. Is there, is there a process to review um, these on a regular basis, or is it kind of as needed? What's, what's the, the process? So that's a great question. Um, we review the, um, any new routes, um, obviously get presented, and, and the board gets a chance to review them. This one in particular was a very unique situation because what we saw, and, and parents rightfully pointed out, was that historically Fairmount School was qualifying as a serious hazard route for this intersection, but O'Neill didn't have a bus. And, and so we had to identify that, or, or excuse me, um, parents identified that, and then we had to address that. And so that's what Katie and her team has done with IDOT. One of the things that we implemented this year, Steve, to really address just what you're saying is the Transportation Committee. And the Transportation Committee is looking at all of those, and, and that's an opportunity for anyone in our community to, like you said, if we, if we have a busier subdivision or if we've got something going on that um, you know, historically maybe hasn't been addressed, that committee can review and then recommend um, whether Katie brings it to the board here for um, IDOT review and then for Board of Education approval. So this year with a, that new committee and in subsequent years, that would be the vehicle to, to do that. Good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to award two judgment <coughs> points to the IDOT rubric and designate the crossing of Fairview Avenue at 59th Street as a serious safety hazard for O'Neill Middle School. We have uh, up a supplemental bond levy as recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to approve the resolution authorizing a supplemental tax levy to pay for the principal of an interest on outstanding limited bonds of the school district 58 uh, of school district number 58, DuPage County, Illinois. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the resolution authorizing a supplemental tax levy to pay the principal of and interest on outstanding limited bonds of school district number 58, DuPage County, Illinois. 
we have a resolution authorizing the transfer from working cash fund to the transportation fund as recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing the transfer of monies from the working cash fund to the transportation fund? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Toshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to adopt the resolution authorizing transfer of monies from the working cash fund to the transportation fund. We have a resolution authorizing the transfer from the working <coughs> cash fund to the education fund as recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing transfer of monies from the working cash fund to the education fund? So moved. Second. Aye. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to adopt the resolution authorizing the transfer of monies from the working cash fund to the education fund. We have a bid for general supplies as recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to award the bid for general office supplies for the 2020-2021 school year to Twist Office Partners for an estimated cost of $28,997.73? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to award the bid for general office supplies for the 2020-2021 school year to Twist Office Partners for an estimated cost of $28,997.73. We have a bid for art supplies as recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to award the <coughs> bid for art supplies for the 2020-2021 School year to Cascade School Supplies for an estimated cost of $19,367.16. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. I motion carry to award the bid for art supplies for the 2020-2021 school year to the Cascade School Supplies for an estimated cost of $19,367.16. We have a bid for paper as recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to award the bid for paper for the 2020-2021 school year to Midland Paper for an estimated cost of $46,288.60? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to award the bid for paper for the 2020-2021 school year to Midland Paper for an estimated cost of $46,288.60. Um, we have the Neopost postage meter contract is recommended by the business office. Is there a motion to approve a 60-month lease with Neopost for $161.47 per month? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. I motion carry to approve a 60-month lease with Neopost for $161.47 a month. Uh, we have a recommendation from the business office for a school maintenance grants application. Is there a motion to approve the District 58's application for a school maintenance project grant? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the District 58's application for a school maintenance project grant. We have a few announcements uh, to make. Uh, Tuesday, February 11th at 5.30 p.m., uh, which is tomorrow, will be a building tour and PTA meeting at O'Neill Middle School. Uh, Tuesday, February 18th at 7 a.m. will be the policy committee meeting at the ASC. Uh, Tuesday, February 18th at 6 p.m. will be a building tour and PTA meeting at Fairmount. 
Monday, February 24th at 3.45 will be the rescheduled district leadership team meeting, and that will take place at Hillcrest. Uh, Monday, February 24th at 6.15 p.m. will be a staff meet and greet at Hillcrest. And then Monday, February 24th at 7 p.m. will be the curriculum workshop also at Hillcrest. At this time, the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss uh, the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district, 5 ILCS 122C1, the purchase or lease of real estate prop of real property for the use of public body, including meetings held for the purpose of discussion whether a particular parcel should be acquired, 5 ILCS 122C5, the placement of individual students in special education programs and other matters relating to individual students, 5 ILCS 122C10, Student disciplinary cases, 5 ILCS 122 C9, and discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purpose of approval by the body of the minutes or semi annual review of the minutes as mandated by Section 2.06, 5 ILCS 122 C21. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannah. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. We will meet at 9.15 p.m. <coughs>